All right. So today we are going to talk about evidentialism. It's a pretty popular view in epistemology that um, a lot of people hold, but there's also quite a bit of debate about it. So we're going to talk about that debate. So let's start with the question, what is evidentialism? Evidentialism is the view that what I should believe is determined only by my evidence. And this view was defended by W. K. Clifford, but also a lot of contemporary epistemologists as well. So why would someone defend this? Why I think evidentialism is true? Well, there's at least two reasons. Reason one is we want true beliefs. And following our evidence is a good way of getting at the truth. It might not be a perfect way because sometimes evidence can be misleading, but normally when we follow evidence, that leads us to truth. Reason number two is that evidentialism can explain cases of good belief and cases of bad belief. So here are some cases of good beliefs. I believe that there is a table in front of me because I see it. So the reason that it's good or rational for me to believe there's a table here is because I have this perceptual evidence and this perceptual evidence justifies me um, making this belief a good one. I believe my partner ate eggs for breakfast this morning because he told me he did. And this would be an example of testimony, testimonial evidence. I have good testimonial, testimonial evidence that my partner ate eggs for breakfast and so I can believe it and that's a good belief. Here's some bad beliefs. So I believe that my ship is safe just because I don't want to pay for the repairs. Let's say my ship, they're about to go take it out on a voyage. I don't feel like paying for any repairs. So I just kind of convince myself that it's safe. This is an example of wishful thinking. And it's a bad belief because I don't actually have evidence my ship is safe. I'm just kind of believing it because I want it to be true. Um, you might also think this, this is a bad belief. I believe that a restaurant serves terrible food uh, just because I dislike the owner, right? Uh, this is a poor inference. Just because I don't get along with an owner doesn't mean his restaurant would serve terrible food. So again, evidentialism can explain this. I don't have good evidence that it serves terrible food and that's why it's a bad belief. Now I want to discuss three challenges to evidentialism that have kind of come up in the epistemology literature. And we're going to talk about all three and give a bunch of examples of them. And then we'll talk a little bit about how an evidentialist might respond to these challenges. The first is epistemic partiality. Don't worry, we're going to say what that means in just a second. The second is moral encroachment. Again, we're going to talk about what that means and give examples. And the third is beneficial beliefs. Okay, so let's start with epistemic partiality, and we're just going to start off with some cases. So case one, Smith is accused of a crime. There is good but not totally decisive evidence that Smith did it. I read about Smith's case in the newspaper, and based on this good evidence, I believe he did it. Case two, my brother is accused of a crime. The evidence that he did it is exactly the same as my evidence that Smith did it. It's good but not decisive. But since he's my brother, good evidence isn't enough. I'm not going to believe he's guilty until I have proof. So this case, these two cases, they kind of raise the question, can we believe differently of someone because they're close to us? Um, and it does kind of seem okay to believe differently about people who are close to us. And in the sibling case that we just talked about, you can apply a stricter standard of evidence to your brother than you would to Smith. And in fact, your brother might be kind of hurt or offended if you don't. Um, but if this is right, then evidentialism is false because what you should believe isn't determined only by your evidence, but it's also determined by whether the belief involves a close friend or family member. So basically epistemic partiality is the view that we can believe differently of someone if they are a close friend or family member. And um, this kind of, this, this view would challenge evidentialism. All right, the second view that challenges evidentialism is what's called moral encroachment. Here's two cases. So case one, you just ordered a package on Amazon, you check the tracking website and it reports that the package is 90% likely to arrive today. So because of this, you believe that it will arrive today. Case two, 
you're at a social club and you know that 90% of the club's members are white and 90% of the wait staff are black. You see John Hope Franklin, a black man, and you believe that he is a waiter. So the package belief and the John Hope Franklin belief have something in common, but they also seem importantly different. So in both cases, you have pretty good evidence that makes the belief 90% likely to be true. But the package belief seems justified. It seems like a, a totally fine belief to have, even a good belief to have. The John Hope Franklin belief doesn't. And Rima Basu argues that this is because sometimes the beliefs we form can wrong other people. So when it comes to the question of what we should believe, our evidence doesn't tell us the full story. We also have to think about whether the belief would wrong someone. So there's kind of a moral component to what we should believe. This is why it's called moral encroachment. The moral is kind of encroaching on the question of what we should believe. So again, if this is right, evidentialism is false because what we should believe isn't determined only by evidence, it's also determined by morality. All right, here is the third challenge to evidentialism. And this is the challenge from beneficial beliefs. So here's case one. You're about to give a very important speech and you know that you've struggled with public speaking in the past, but you also know that if you believe you'll give a great speech, this will give you confidence and calm and it'll just make the whole thing go a lot better. So you decide to believe you'll give an awesome speech. Here's case two. You're hiking in a deserted area and you get lost and you run out of food and water. You wander around for a long time and you finally find the path home. However, to get to this path, you have to jump across a pretty wide crevice. You estimate your chances of making the jump are about 50-50. And you have two choices. If you believe that you won't make it, there's no way you're gonna have the motivation to try. And unfortunately, you'll probably just die out there in the wilderness. But if you believe you will make it, this will give you passion and energy and motivation to try to make the jump. And it might even make you jump a little further. So for this reason, you believe you'll make it. It's kind of your best chance at survival. So these are cases, some, some, these are cases that are inspired by ones given by William James in The Will to Believe. And James thought that sometimes it's worth going out on a limb and believing something, even if that belief kind of outstrips or goes beyond your evidence. And this is because the belief could have important benefits to yourself and to other people. So William James argued that when it comes to our belief, we have two goals. We want to believe truth and we want to avoid error. And I think sometimes it's really easy to focus on avoiding error, but believing truth is also important too. And for this reason, James thought it's okay to kind of go out on a limb to take a risk by believing something, especially if you have a lot to gain if it's true and you don't have much to lose if it's false. So we've seen three challenges to evidentialism. Um, we've seen epistemic partiality, the idea that we might be able to believe differently of those close to us than those we don't have a relationship with. We've seen moral encroachment, the idea that moral factors rather than just evidence might uh, play a role in determining what we should believe. And then we've seen cases of beneficial beliefs where it might be okay for our beliefs to outstrip the evidence if we have a lot to gain um, and a little to lose. So how would an evidentialist respond to these cases? Well, they might say that in some of these cases, even though it might appear that you have the same evidence, you actually don't have the same evidence in both situations. So when we think about Smith versus your brother, when they're both accused of a crime, Smith, you don't, you don't know anything, you don't know about him, you don't know about his character, um, but your brother, you've grown up with your whole life, and so you have a lot of background evidence about who your brother is. And so an evidentialist might say, actually, you can apply a stricter standard to your brother, but that's just because you have way more evidence about him than you have about Smith. So the difference in belief is explained by a difference in evidence. In the jumping the crevice case, the evidentialist might also say, that um, this is a case where really interestingly, a belief creates its own evidence. So when you believe that you'll make the jump, this gives you that passion and that motivation, which makes it more likely you'll make the jump. So you actually do have different evidence when you believe you'll make the jump than if you believe you won't make the jump. So they might try to argue that there is actually differences in evidence in some of these cases. 
And then they might say in other cases, we're just wrong about what you should believe. You shouldn't believe differently in case one and case two. And I think another thing they might push is, well, look, if you're saying that factors besides evidence, like morality or whether a belief is beneficial, if those factors can affect what we should believe, then how do we explain why wishful thinking and hasty generalization are bad reasons for belief? The evidentialists can give a very clear explanation. Those are bad because they're not based on evidence. Um, but it's harder when you start blurring that line to be able to say why wishful thinking is bad or irrational. Um, so I think that's sort of a challenge for the person who denies evidentialism. All right, so what we've covered so far, uh, we've covered evidentialism, we've covered three challenges to evidentialism, epistemic partiality, moral encroachment, and beneficial beliefs. And then we've talked about how an evidentialist might respond to these challenges. And of course, this is not the end of that debate. Um, there's probably more the evidentialist could say about those cases, but then also um, things that the people who challenge evidentialism could say in response.